Some key engineering decisions are made in the design settings, and due to the various dissimilarities between the US and Canadian design settings, this tutorial will focus on the US version. A future video on design settings will provide guidance for the Canadian version. The first decision to make is which wind load standard to use for your structure. There are two choices, a low rise method and a more general method. In the ASC 710, the all heights method was changed to directional all heights rather than simply be referred to the all heights method. Similarly, the low rise method from previous ASC 7 version is now referred to as the envelope low rise method. The low rise option will benefit the designer by giving a slightly less conservative design, but is limited to single blocks. The all heights method is more flexible, allowing the entry of any building shape. As for the seismic design, an equivalent static method suitable for almost all wood structures is used. In the US version, the default value for load combination factors and wind capacity increase factors are based on the ASC 710 Clause 2.4.1 Basic Allowable Stress Design Combinations. In comparison to the previous version of shear walls where it was possible to enter different load combination factors than the ones from ASC 7, the current version does not allow input of different load combination factors. The reason being that ASC 7 has adopted an allowable stress design wind factor of 0.6 which is identical to that of IBC rather than the previous factor of 1.0. This change is in conjunction with the new wind speed maps with higher wind speeds intended for strength level design. The program retains the 1.0 wind load combination factor for deflection, which is now the strength level in ASC 7. This change makes wind design consistent with seismic design. The new 0.6 factor is now applied to forces used for shear well design, hold down selection, and drag strut forces. The loads as shown on screen and in the loads table remain unfactored but are factored by the 0.6 factor prior to the load distribution to the shear lines while the loads reported in the deflection analysis are based on the strength level factor. To illustrate this concept, let's look at segment 1-1 of the following structure. It can be seen that the allowable stress design force is factored by 0.6 in comparison to the force used for the deflection analysis which is factored by the 1.0 force factor. Some jurisdictions mandate a reduction in shear capacities for either wind or seismic design. You can apply a factor if the locally mandated shear strength differ from the IBC or SPIDWIS requirements. The values entered here factor the published wood sheathing strength in conjunction with all other factors. The factor does not apply to gypsum or fiberboard for which the shear strength depends entirely on the strength of the material and not the nailing. The default value is 1.0, so adjusting this to a lower number will reduce the capacity. You can decide to include a deflection analysis. For deflection settings, view the hold downs tab, and for editing the hold down database, select the edit hold down database. The hold down database can also be accessed through the hold downs data bar. Including deflection analysis also enables the distribution of the loads to be done using stiffness rather than capacity. When designing shear walls, there are limitations to the height to width ratios based on the materials. This limit is 3.5 to 1 for wood and fiberboard sheathing and 2 to 1 for most other sheathing materials. If a wall segment's height to width ratio exceeds the limit, 
it is not considered to contribute to shear resistance in the calculations of the design. You can choose to disregard shear wall height to width limitations to implement proprietary non-wood shear resisting elements. Do this with caution. A new shear wall stand feature found in the design settings is the worst case rigid versus flexible diaphragm design, also referred to as the envelope design. This feature is handy when many unknowns are left for the wall's parameters. In comparison to earlier versions where shear walls would design separate walls for wind design, seismic design, flexible distribution, rigid distribution, and both force directions, thus resulting in a possibility of eight design walls for each physical wall in the structure, shear walls version 10 now compares the walls designed for wind and seismic and selects the walls that has the highest capacity. Essentially, the program compares the walls designed for wind and seismic and selects the wall that has the highest capacity to redistribute the forces on the line if deflection is the force distribution criterion. Consequently, the selected wall is also used to redistribute forces to the shear lines for the rigid diaphragm procedure. As a result of this implementation, in the shear results, Shear walls now displays which case was critical to the selection of the wall. For example, if a wall had unknown parameters, the letter S will be displayed beside the response ratio in the wind design tables if seismic was the critical case. Similarly, the letter W is printed beside the response ratio in the seismic table if the critical case was wind. This design setting is set by default to be checked. However, the setting will automatically be disabled if you have not chosen to design for flexible or rigid diaphragm in the structure input. This option is available as for light frame construction. ASC7 permits the designer to idealize the diaphragm as flexible only if specific requirements are met and exempt from the rigid diaphragm distribution assumption. You can also decide to ignore non-wood panel contribution. There are two options for this section. Ignore non-wood panel contribution for all walls or ignore non-wood panel contribution when combined with structural wood panels. The second option, ignoring non-wood when combined with wood, applies to both wind and seismic design and has the benefit of allowing narrower wood sheet walls with an aspect ratio of greater than 2 but less than 3.5 to 1 to contribute to the design. If, for example, a wall with gypsum wallboard on one side and OSB on the other, relying on the gypsum wallboard would require the more stringent aspect ratio of 2 to 1 to be met, resulting in any wood sheet wall with an aspect ratio between 2 and 3.5 to 1 not contributing to the resistance. Selecting ignore non-wood for all walls applies only to seismic design and has the benefit of allowing a higher response modification coefficient of 6.5 or 7, which is usually far more beneficial than allowing gypsum wallboard to contribute to the seismic force resisting system while resisting a much higher base shear due to the lower response modification coefficient of 2 or 2.5. To show the effect of the ignore non-wood panel contribution boxes, I will keep the gypsum wallboard on the interior side of wall a1 and B1 in the east-west direction and select none for the walls in the north-south direction. Note that it is important to remove the design and group options for wall B1 and A1. Elsewise, when removing the interior sheathing of the two other walls, the changes would also be applied to the walls in the east-west direction. Since there is already gypsum wallboard on the interior side, we will proceed with removing the interior sheathing for the walls in the north-south direction. Having the design and group option for the walls in the north-south direction allows us to select only one wall and apply the desired change in order to apply it to both walls. By leaving the boxes unchecked in the settings, it is necessary to generate the load such that the proper R values are chosen. 
as it can be seen in the site information, for the east-west direction, the value is either 2 or 2.5, depending on whether it is a bearing wall or a building frame system. For the north-south directions, the walls only have exterior sheathing, so we can see that the R values are 6.5 and 7, depending on whether it is a bearing wall or a building frame system. When the R value is 2, there is an increase in the seismic loading compared to when the value is 7 because the non-wood panel materials are part of the seismic resistance system. Now we will select ignore non-wood panel contributions for all walls, which means that gypsum and plaster materials, fiberboard and lumber sheathing will not be considered as contributing to the shear strength of any shear walls designed to resist seismic load. After we have chosen the option, we can delete and regenerate all the loads. In this case, we can see that the R value has now changed to 6.5 and 7.5 in both directions depending on the system. For seismic design, structural wood panels are only allowed to have aspect ratios as high as 3.5 to 1. If you do not want to allow a height to width ratio between 2 and 3.5, Simply make sure that the option to allow 3.5 to 1 height to width ratios is left unchecked. For out of plane sheathing assumption, we can choose to have sheathing that's spanning over 2 studs or 3 studs. 2 span is assumed in speed width, but higher capacities are achieved if sheathing spans over 3 studs. If this is true in your building, selecting 3 span will provide a 25% increase in the out of plane capacity of the sheathing. To view the difference, we will select two spans and generate the loads on the building. We will run the design, go to table, wind design, components and cladding by shear line. Shown here is the capacity of the sheathing. Now we will select the three span option. By regenerating the loads and running the design again, we will compare the two values. We can see that the capacity has increased by 25%. The next section, maximum shear line offset, in the plan entry, you input the maximum separation between parallel wall segments on the same building level in order to assume it is a single shear line. The wood frame construction manual prescribes a maximum of 4 feet, but the default is set to 6 inches. Similarly, the elevation entry sets a maximum distance measured relative to joist depth of wall on different floors. You can also determine whether the drag strut and hold down forces are based on the applied loads or the design shear walls capacity. By default, both forces will be based on the loads distributed to the shear lines. Certain situations require hold downs and drag struts to be designed based on the strength of the shear wall in order to ensure the drag struts and hold downs do not fail before the shear wall fails, and so selecting the shear wall capacity would be appropriate then. There are two common approaches to determine a shear wall's relative rigidity derived from deflection, based on its capacity or its stiffness. Shear wall's rigidity is important when distributing loads to shear lines using rigid diaphragm analysis. The capacity method is much easier to calculate and is an acceptable alternative to more rigorous stiffness deflection method. The shear wall deflection method calculates rigidity based on the stiffness of the segments derived from the four-term deflection equation. This uses a rigorous analysis that includes bending deflection, sheathing shear deflection, and nail and hold down slippage to determine the deflection, the inverse of which is stiffness. You can also decide to assume shear walls have equal rigidity, which assume that all shear walls have the same rigidity per unit length. So the rigidity of any shear line is proportional to its length. Use this approach with caution. Manually assigning the relative rigidities is also possible. When you select this option, the default value is 1 for all shear walls, which means all shear walls have equal rigidity. This method may be useful when trying to include proprietary walls in your design.
try distributing loads using deflection first, then change to manual, which opens up the relative rigidity per unit length in the wall input window. Then modify the appropriate relative rigidities to suit the proprietary product. You may need to disregard shear wall height to width limitations. Furthermore, there is a checkbox to distribute forces to wall segments based on rigidity, which distributes the forces to each wall segment within a shear line once the forces are distributed to the shear line based on wall rigidity. The method used to distribute loads to shear lines will be the same method used to distribute loads within shear lines. The service conditions applies to all walls on the structure. Shearwalls applies the service condition factors to the nail withdrawal calculations for component cladding as well as determines the amount of shrinkage for the purpose of calculating deflections. In the US version, you can choose from three temperature ranges and the program applies the appropriate factor for nail withdrawal of strain. The last section, apply height to width ratio to each block or entire block relates to the calculation of the external pressure coefficient CP when there are multiple blocks within your structure. Simply put, when choosing the entire structure option with a structure that has, for example, two blocks with one block that is one story and the other six stories, it will create an overly conservative estimate of the wind load for the block with only one story. Selecting each block will force shear walls to calculate the external pressure coefficient CP for the different blocks and thus avoid conservatively estimating the wind load for the one story block. This concludes the tutorial about the design settings in the US.